parents, as coaches, as leaders, as organizations, can we intentionally become more creative? And if the answer to that is yes, how would we go about it? How would we do it? We're going to steal a few lessons from a legend. I'm going to give you four things that you can absolutely do, four simple things that you can do to increase your creativity, period, if you'll do something with them. When my daughter turned five, I have two daughters, and when my oldest turned five, we took her to Disney World. You know, and my wife and I were convinced it was kind of a creative place to go for her fifth birthday. They give her this button, it says, you know, happy birthday, Ella, on it, and we're going around Disney, and, uh, you know, she sees people left and right. Daddy, daddy, look, it's, it's her birthday, too. You know, dad, oh, his birthday, too. She goes, wow, daddy, there's five other Ella's who have a birthday here today. And I thought, well, maybe it wasn't, uh, you know, the most unique thing to do on her fifth birthday. But, but, we're waiting online at Epcot Center for the ride soar. And my, we're, we're right in the front of the line. My daughter's got this button on. And the woman that runs the, the, the ride looks at my daughter and she says, is it your birthday? And my daughter, like, yeah, yeah, she's five. Yeah, yeah, yes. And the woman says, how old are you? And my daughter didn't answer. She just kind of turned tight with she was like, yeah, she's still down, you know? And uh, you know, the woman says, you're five. You're five. And the woman had one more amazed, delighted look on her face that I think I've ever seen. She said, wait a second, wait, 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 five, five? Do you know what that means? And my daughter is still standing inside of me, and I can see in her brain, she's going, I'm not sure. Am I supposed to know the answer to this question? Goes, what does it mean? I thought, it means, um, and the woman says, five, that means you can rock, you can be in charge of this rock. And my daughter kind of looks up at me, and looks at the woman, and the woman says, yeah, come on, this side of this computer terminal. And she says, I'm going to show you. My, my daughter goes over there and she shows me. There's a little monitor and it has a picture of doors, just doors, video of door, doors. And the woman says, those doors are the exit to the ride. When those doors open, it means the people on the ride right now are going to get off. And when that happens, you push this button right here and the doors will open for us to go on. And my daughter's just, you know, she's looking at the screen. And, you know, I'm like probably every day on my video on the whole thing. You know, and, and she, she's waiting. And then the doors open. And then my daughter froze because it was. So she kind of looks up at the lady, and the lady goes to her, and she says, my daughter gets that button, those doors open. Bam. Bam. That happened because of one question. One question Walt Disney asked 60 years ago. 60 years ago, he said, how can every one of our people at every one of our parks around the world, how can they take five minutes out every single day and create a memory that will last for the lifetime of one of our guests? Simple question, isn't it? Simple question. There are four things I want to share with you that the most creative people on the planet tend to have in common. Now, it's, it's interesting to ask that question. What do the most creative people on the planet have in common? Because there are not a lot of things. But I think you'll find over and over that these four happen. And there are four things that you and I can intentionally do. Number one, they ask great questions. They ask great questions. Do they always start with great questions? No. Sometimes they start with crazy questions. Sometimes they start with different questions. You know, as young children, my daughter is a great example. It's the other day she comes up to me and she, you know, she says, Daddy, um, I'm trying to figure this out. She said, I've been trying to figure this out for a while. She said, way back, really long time ago when you were little. And she said, was everything kind of gray, like black and white? Because my, my parents had been going through an old, old photo album with her, and she's convinced that the world, we didn't see colors back then. <laughs> and then, you know, the little says, Daddy, I always wanted to ask that, and I just never remembered to ask it. You know, and I think sometimes we, we might have the great questions. We might have some of them, but we don't necessarily ask them. If you go back in time to 20 years before Disneyland was open, Walt Disney loved to take his daughters to a little amusement park called Griffith Park. Not a amusement park, sorry, a regular park. And there was a merry go there, a little carousel. And he'd sit on the green park bench. And he'd watch them on this carousel. And he'd start thinking about, what if, you know, what if this magical experience affected the whole family? What if the magic didn't fade? What if the magic weren't just here, but I, I could come here with my, 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 my wife, my kids. I could come here even when they were teenagers. He started asking me, what if there were a place where there was no chipped paint and where all the horses jumped while he was watching that carousel go around and around and around? Now, can you and I intentionally ask better questions? Can we, can we intentionally ask better questions? 
couple of years ago, I was in a pretty dramatic car accident. You know, long story short, black ice, the car started sliding on the highway, two tractor trailers hit it, like a hockey puck, it goes spinning down the road. The car stops in the left lane. I get out of the car, and I realize we're stopped still on the highway. I get out of the car, and I look, and there's cars, oncoming traffic coming right at where I'm standing. So I decide to run out of the way. And I start running, and I come near this guardrail. I'm about two steps away from this guardrail. I'm about to just jump over it. I played basketball college. I thought, no problem. I can just jump over it. But about two steps before I jumped, I thought, don't jump. So instead, I climbed over it. And then I realized I was hanging. My feet were dangling. I was on Interstate 80 near Clarion, Pennsylvania, mile marker 60, 106 feet between me and the ground. 106 feet between me and the ground. And you know, see, I share that because we all have experiences that shape us up, right? But we don't all necessarily use them to change the questions we ask. And I decided, I said, I'm going to start changing the questions I asked. I said, I'm going to start asking, what are you looking for? What are you looking for? What are you looking for? I said, I'll look every day for something that wakes me up, that moves me, that makes me think, that challenges me. What are you looking for? Pretty good question. Pretty good question. I think a lot of times the quality of our life hinges on the quality of questions that we pursue. What are you looking for? Another question I started asking is, Jonathan, who are you becoming? In this conversation, are you becoming more or less patient, more or less convicted, more or less sincere, more or less forgiving, more or less focused? Who are you becoming? Another question I started asking is, who are you helping people around you to become? Who are you helping people around you to become? And then I said, you know what, do you have some people that challenge you to become? And we all do, don't we? How many of you have someone in your life that challenges you to become? You wouldn't be who you are today without those people, right? You have a few of them, right? Do you have a hundred of them? I mean, one simple question you could ask is, how could I find one more person like that? Maybe in the, in the world, maybe from history, that challenges you to become. Maybe the question you ask is, how can I do that to one more person? You know, a friend of mine went to Calcutta. He spent three weeks with the, uh, the missionaries of charity. And he comes back and he hands me three phenomenal questions. Phenomenal questions. Phenomenal questions. One, he said they kept telling him this. And he said it wasn't rude. But they kept saying, like, go find your own Calcutta. <laughs> and he said they, they, weren't, they weren't singing the rude way, but they were saying, What's your place to leave an impact on the world? It's not this. You can do something good here, but go home and help someone. Go in your backyard and, and serve. Find another place to serve. Another question I started asking, by the way, is how can you use today? How can you use your talents and your passions to serve? How can you use your talents and passions to serve? Do you let ideas like this grow? See, Walt Disney sitting on that park bench? Me and you, we all have moments like that, don't we? Sitting on that park bench thinking, I wonder what, I wonder if, I wonder how, I wonder, you know, do you think this could? And I was out in the lobby looking at this airplane linking up to KC-1, right? Linking up to a, you know, refuel a fighter jet. And I'm looking at it, I'm thinking, once upon a time, once upon a time someone said, I wonder if you could refuel the air. I bet a lot of people said, you're crazy. I bet a lot of fuel dripped down somewhere <laughs> in that process. But can you start building better questions? You know, the, wh where's your Calcutta, right? Two other questions I got from my friend coming back from there. He said, I kept starting to ask myself, you know, how can I do small things with great love? How can I do small things with great love? I mean, as a parent, if you're a parent, what if you build that question into your days? Can you come up with a whole bunch of small things that you can do with great love? If you're in a leadership role, can you come up with a whole bunch of answers to that question? How can I do things today? Small things with great love. Another question comes back from Calcutta with this, Jonathan, how can you live more simply so that others may simply live? How can I live more simply today so others may simply live? Ask great questions. Start collecting great questions. Number two, number two, expect there to be an answer. Expect there to be an answer. You know, if you over the next few weeks just started collecting questions and you added a few questions to your list every day, 5, 10, 15, 20 questions, you would come up with some really good questions. Then I challenge you to look at that list and say, do I think there's an answer? If I had to give it a zero to ten, zero, I don't think there's any answer. Ten, I think there's absolutely an answer. Where are you? Try to, try to be honest. Because a lot of times we ask a good question, we're just like, there's no answer to that. There's no answer to that. Muhammad Yunus, right, won the Nobel Prize a few years ago. Look him up, look him up. But he asks this question. He says, how, how can we affect the world in a way so that 30 years from now, poverty exists only in museums? Well, that's a question, isn't it? 
but then he goes about attacking the problem as if there are solutions. If you just took that question, say, can, can we affect the world in a way that poverty will only exist in a museum for the next 30 years? Most of us would be close to zero on that one, right? Is that possible? Are there solutions to that? Most of us would be close to zero, maybe one. Eunice just goes about it, and he started over 100, he calls them social businesses. Businesses that are completely scalable, that exist only to serve a need, but they're self-sustaining. And he's done it with water, and sneakers, and yogurt, and banking for the poorest people on the planet, and dozens and dozens of other things. You know, but can you go at it saying, no, there's a solution to this, there's a solution. Someone has found a solution to this. Walt Disney, age 23, age 23, he says, I want to create great cartoons, right? Most of us, by the way. Most of us do this. I call it the, the innovator's equation. We, look, we go through life saying six plus four equals. Six plus four equals ten. In other words, I have six dollars and four people working with me. I can create ten. I have this education. I have this. These are my comps. These are my last year numbers. I can create as a result of yesterday. I can create this. Right? Walt Disney very often would shift to forget that. I want to create what? Let's spend time there before I ask what do I need to create that what? At the age of 23, he says, I want to create tremendous cartoons. And he realizes he's not a very gifted artist. So he fires himself at the age of 23. Never to do any art for Disney again for the rest of his life at the age of 23. You know, do you expect there to be answers? Do you say, what am I trying to create? Forget the six plus four. Forget what I did yesterday. Forget what's on my resume. What's on my LinkedIn. What's on my, you know, forget, I went to this school. Oh, if only, if only yesterday were. And it spends time on that bottom equation. So ask great questions, expect to find answers. The next two go together. The next two go together. The next two are collect ideas. Collect ideas. Collect ideas from anywhere, everywhere. Collect ideas. Just start gathering ideas. And they could be linked to your questions, or they could be completely different from your questions. Collect ideas. Be exposed to thought processes. Now, at one time, I was talking to people about training for torture prep. And I was just thinking, I, I love collecting ideas. I just file them away. I file them away. And I think, like, how, how does that relate to emotional intelligence in a business meeting? Collect ideas. And the next one is mix those ideas together. Experiment with those ideas. I like to call it F4OB. F4 will be, it says fail forward fast frequently, and if you can, off Broadway. Mm -hmm. Fail forward fast frequently, and if you can, off Broadway. In other words, make mistakes, mess up, right? Mess up. Walt Disney, 1934, says we're going to build the first ever full feature cartoon movie. <clears throat> Snow White and Seven Dwarfs. Just, just, if you were in that meeting, 1934, great depression going on, they don't have money to do it. Their cartoons usually cost $25,000 to make back then, and Snow White would cost them over one point. Five million. He told his brother, his brother's like, we're not doing it. Uh, his brother was a finance guy. Brother, no, no, we're not doing it. Walt says it's going to cost about a quarter million. Or he says it's going to cost at least four hundred, five hundred thousand dollars We're not doing it. Walt says, you know, when it passed a million, Roy got very nervous. When it passed 1.5 million, Roy didn't even blink because he was unconscious. <laughs> You know, and, and, and if you imagine if you're in that meeting and you say, we're going to make a movie called Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, how many dwarf names would you come up with? How many dwarf names would you come up with? Somewhere around seven? Most of us would come up with 10 or 15, right? We'd come up with 10 or 15 this week, and the crash would run a lot of money, run a lot of time. Let's get this done. By Friday, we're going to narrow it down to seven. For two years, the team worked with 64 dwarf names. But not just names. They had character traits. They had voices. They had descriptions. They had, what will this person look like? They had drawn out different scenarios with each of these dwarfs. I mean, I would have loved to see weepy and hungry and dirty. I would have loved to see those in a skit. Now, you know what? Dirty doesn't fit. Let's put Jazzy in there. Or there was a dwarf named Biggie Wiggy. Oh, Biggie Wiggy or Big Old Ego was another one. I mean, and they would run these scenarios. They'd say, that scenario works, but take out, take out weepy. Weepy doesn't fit there. You know, let's put sappy in there. And they worked out scenarios with 64 dwarf names. My challenge to you is collect ideas, mix them together, and mess up. And you know what? Most of us have a challenge that we could come up with three solutions for it. Come up with five next time. Don't come up with 64. I understand. But come up with five next time. And give it an extra day of marinating and playing with ideas before you say, this is the one we're doing. Simple thing you can do, isn't it? Collect ideas, experiment with those ideas. You know, let me end with this simple story. When uh, 
we, I've been teaching my daughters to speak. Teach my daughters to speak. And uh, Ella, last winter, we go down this this slope, and um, you know she sees that there's a race course on the side. It's not a really steep slope, but there's a race course on the side. She sees it, and she says, oh, <laughs> "Can I race that?" And I said, "Sure, you could." You know, she goes down the race, but she goes very cautiously. You know, and I'm watching. She's really cautious, really slow. And at the end of this little race course, they tell her how long it took. And she hears that. And then she says, can we wait? And we wait, and the next few people go through, and they, they announce their times, too. And my daughter, eight years old at the time, she, she says, oh, they beat me. A couple of them beat me. Can we do it again? I'm like, sure, we could. So we go back up the lift, and she does it again. This time I'm videoing her. I'm skiing next to her in the open snow. I'm videoing her. And she's doing great. She's cruising. And then all of a sudden, a little bit, <laughs> She gets pretty, pretty good speed, and then she does this really amazing move, sort of like that, sort of like this, and sort of like bam, and does some serious sliding. And I'm thinking, this is one of those. I'm sure you right for the other. <laughs> and Ella's laying on the ground, and her skis, one skis way up there, the other one's kind of over here, and she's laying there. And I ski right up, and I'm like, Ella, that was awesome, that was unbelievable. She's like, yeah. <laughs> and it got me thinking. It got me thinking, you know, innovation, right? Ask great questions. That's easy. You can, you can do that over the next couple weeks. You just ask better questions, collect them, ask better. You, you can work on it. You can talk yourself into, you know, there's an answer to this. You can do that, right? You can collect ideas. You can experiment with those ideas. But one of the things that challenges most of us the most is we at some point stop falling face first into the snow. We just say, ah, it, it might hurt, it might be cold. I don't want to pick up the skis. You know, my challenge to you is do something with one of these things and be willing, be willing to take something. Maybe it's in a relationship, maybe it's in a friendship, maybe it's in a leadership role, maybe it's in business, maybe it's in work, maybe it's in a nonprofit board, you're involved in coaching, sport, I don't know. Be willing to experiment with something even though you might fall face first into the snow. Thank you very much.